How many of you, just by a shout of praise, don't shout it if you don't mean it, how many of you had a really great week? Give me a shout if you did. Really great. Okay. How many of you, the same shout of not praise, said, man, my week is tough. Go ahead and shout and say, I had a tough week. Shout it out. Okay. That's good. All right. So we got all types of people in here. Man, I had an incredible week. I've actually, this is my fourth time preaching in like uh, four days. And so I, I've been able to preach a little bit and it's been really good. I've seen people saved. God has been, the spirit has been all over some people in some places that I've been. And here's what was cool. I went to a camp in Raleigh and the camp, um, it, it didn't have any music. It didn't have any music. So they played some YouTube videos and, and it was to teenagers. And if you know anything about teenagers, they're tough. And so like, I was thinking, oh man, this, this might not go over too well. And it started off rocky, but let me tell you what happened. By the end of the service, the message was done. We had an altar call and, and I, you know, we were just going to play one song and they, <laughs> some kids ended up, probably about 20 of them ended up staying for two and a half hours after it was done because the spirit of God was in that place. And here's what I know about church. Church has become so programmed, so processed that we have said, Holy spirit, you can have a little part, but don't you control our service. And I don't ever want this place to be like that. I want us to be okay to, to just be spirit led and spirit filled and not what, know what's going on. And so I thank you worship team uh, for just pouring your heart and soul out today. I thank you church for receiving. And let me ask you a question. This is our last message today in the series that we're calling Summer in the Psalms. So we've been going through the book of Psalms and uh, just picking them out and, and seeing what God has to say. This is the very last message in it. And it's, it's, it's a tough one. Psalm 73 is a tough psalm. Psalm 73 is where we're going to be. How many of you have ever or even currently struggled with doubt? Doubt. Just raise your hand. Perfect. Me too. I, I'm kind of titling this about with doubt. Psalm 73. And I'm going to talk primarily to those who are believing in God today. Because I know something about you. There's been moments that you've doubted something about your faith. Right? Like, why didn't God come through? The lady that I knew, she prayed forever that her dad would not die at, at this time. It, she felt like it wasn't his time. He wasn't that old. Or her mom, excuse me, her mom wouldn't die. And, and sure enough, she died. And she's like, Chris, I don't understand. I don't understand. I prayed. I fasted. I, I do right. I, I, I love God. I begged. I did everything that was prescribed. Did God not hear me? Did I do something wrong? Did I pray wrong? Does God even care? Is this whole thing real? I think there's many people who struggle with doubt. You didn't get the job. You're still single. You're divorced. You're widowed. The test came back positive or negative. Where are you, God? How could you allow this to happen? I love you. I'm struggling. Does this resonate? Or how about this? You ever look at just people who don't love God? People who, maybe they're not evil in the sense where they're out there doing a bunch of harm, but they're not lovers of God. And they seem to have everything that you want. They seem to get blessed. They seem that, to, you know, they're in the relationships and the finances and the family. And here you are loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you're just thinking, how in the world, God, could you bless bad people? Could you bless evil? People who don't love you, God, why won't you pour that same blessing on me? I think we've all asked these questions. Do you know that people in the Bible had doubts? Do you know actually many of the authors had doubts? John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. He said, I, I'm not so sure you're, you're the Messiah. Um, one of Jesus' closest followers and friends, Thomas. What's his nickname? 
Doubting Thomas. What, a, what an awful name, the way we remember him. Full of doubt. Matthew tells us that some people doubted after Jesus was raised. So I want to tell you first and foremost that doubt is not bad. Okay? It's what you do with the doubt. See, doubt will either drive you from God or drive you deeper into God. And my fear is that many people start doubting and instead of digging into God, digging into their faith, digging into his word, they just run because it's not worth it. Especially when you look at the world and it seems like, look, you look at everybody who's famous, everybody who's prospering, the majority of them don't love God. And you're like, why? Why in the world, God, could you allow that? What am I doing wrong? This is why this psalm is written. Psalm 73. Written by Asaph, one of the chief worship leaders. Here's what he says in verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Now, you need to understand something about Asaph. Asaph understands who God is. Asaph is like many of you. You know who God is. You know that he is good. You know this. To those who love him. He blesses. So Asaph is like us. He's not a wicked person. He is a godly person. But listen to verse 2. As quickly as he declares God is good, he's got a big old butt coming. Verse 2. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was, underline this word, envious. I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Look, Asaph confesses what we feel a lot of times. He confesses that he's envy. He's envious. You ever get jealous? You ever want stuff that you can't have? You ever look at other people and go, man, I wish this. I wish I had. Man, I, I said this before. My neighbor used to have this amazing truck. And now it seems like everybody in my life group has an amazing truck except me. I'm driving like this beat up 2012 Sonata. And, and, but, and every time I, they come over, I'm so happy to see them, but I'm a, little, I'm a little jealous of their trucks. I'm just waiting for them to gift me one one day. It's, gonna, it's a blessing, <laughs> right? I mean, I get a little envious. I've wanted a truck my whole life. And so, but I'm, I'm, I'm envious. I'm jealous. Do you know what envy is? You ever been envious? Let me, t let me give you a definition I heard. I think it's a great definition. Envy is resenting God's goodness in other people's lives or ignoring God's goodness in your life. See, keep it up there. It's not just wanting what other people have. Sometimes it's the inability to see what you have. See, we get so focused on what we don't have, we can't see what we do have. See, we're worried about the car we can't drive while I'm not concerned about my health because I have great health. While other people are struggling to take a breath. And see, we've got to get our eyes focused in the right place. Asaph says, I'm envious. And envy is wrong. When you resent, you resent God's goodness in other people. That's wrong. And when you don't recognize God's goodness in your life, that is wrong. How do I know this is a big deal? James chapter 3 Verses 14 through 16. Listen to this. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts. In other words, if you're envious, do not boast and be false to the truth. There's not wisdom that comes down from above. Where does this envy come from? It comes from earthly, unspiritual, and demonic things. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Is envy a big deal? Absolutely. Think about Adam and Eve in the garden. They were envious, right? They're, look, y'all, they're literally butt naked, running around with God in the garden, happy, free. They ain't caring about anything in the world. They have perfect, it, it's great. It's what we all desire. Fellowship with God, freedom, no guilt, no shame, no condemnation. We want all of that today, but Adam and Eve grew envy. 
They had envy inside of them, and they became envious, right? They, they wanted more. Don't take that bite. Don't take that fruit. I wonder if God really, I wonder what's out there. I, I, maybe I should just try it. They had FOMO. FOMO. You know FOMO, don't you? Fear of missing out. F-O-M-O. -O, FOMO. Some of us are afraid that we are missing out all the time. And this is what happened. They resented God's goodness in someone else while ignoring God's goodness in their own life. Envy is so dangerous. In fact, envy destroys us. Proverbs 14.30 says, A heart at peace gives life to a body. How many of you know when you're at peace, when you're on the mountaintop, when life is going well, when you feel good, not just on the outside, but on the inside, in your heart, in your mind, you have freedom. You can do anything. But watch what it says. Envy makes the bones rot. That's what jealousy, selfishness, desiring what other people have, thinking you're not good enough because you don't have, all of this destroys you from the inside. Now, why in the world does Asaph, a godly man, a chief musician of God's people, why is he envious? He's got it all. Go back to that verse and look at it. He says he's envious of the arrogant when he saw the prosperity of the wicked. Y'all, he's envy of people who don't love God. He's envious of that. They, they are getting everything that they want. They're prospering today. Their business are booming. Their families are thriving they're going on date nights. They're doing it right. They got five kids, but somehow they're, they're doing it right. Their finances, they're not only okay, they're thriving. They got savings. They got beach houses. They got boats. They got mountaintop experiences. They don't ever have a worry in the world. God, these people don't love you. And why in the world are you, are you not blessing me like that? Because I love you. And I've got health problems, I got marriage problems, I got money problems, I got kid problems, I got mind problems, job problems. How come, God, I'm sitting here, I'm in church today, I love you, I'm praying, I'm in the word, I'm in a group, I'm serving, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, God, but I'm not being blessed like that. That's real, isn't it? That's real. This is where Asaph is. And listen how he describes the people that he's jealous about. The people who don't love God. They have no pangs unto death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not, they got enough to eat. They're not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. So they're not only getting everything they want. They're evil. They're not good people. They will do whatever they, that it takes to climb to the top. Their eyes swell out through fatness in verse 7. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and they speak with malice. Their tongue is used to tear people down, to cut people, to get ahead. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. These people think they're better than everybody because they have everything. They don't need anyone, and they don't need God. If they need God, then they're just going to earn their way or buy their way or get, make sure they are first to get to God. That's why he says in verse 10, Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say this, How can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. In other words, God, do you even know what's going on? This is what Asaph's asking. See, they assume that whatever is out there belongs to them. And if heaven is real, they're going to get first dibs. And they don't really see a need for God. But yet, these jokers got everything I want. They have everything they need, so they don't need God. Now, before we go, man, I'm glad I'm not like that. Hold up. How quickly do we forget God when we're on the mountain? How quickly 
Do we forget God when life is easy, life is not difficult, life is not hard, and we don't have any dire emergencies? See, we tend to say, oh, it's because of my talent and my ability and the reasons that I am climbing the ladder, the reasons my family is successful, the reasons my kids are the way they are is because I parented them right. I did this. I did this. And we dismiss God. I mean, where did you get your ability? Where did you get your knowledge? Where did you get your covering of grace? Where did you get your health? Where did you get your safety? Where did you get being born in America? Do you think that if you were born in India, you would be here right now being the same person? That is by the grace of God that you have the ability to hear the preaching and teaching of God's word, that you have a Bible, uh, unlimited access every single day of your life. You can hear from God anytime you want, but other people don't know that. You have so much. We have so much. See, when, when things are going well, we think we're in control. And it's only when things go bad that we think we need God. That's when we pray. That's when we come to the altar. We, we, we don't pray. I don't pray when things are going great. Because I think I'm in charge. So we better be careful if we're judging those people. Then Asaph says this. It's pretty sad. He says in verse 13, all in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every day morning it's just vanity God I'm coming to church I've decided to get my life right with you I'm praying God I've been praying for my spouse I've been praying for my kids God I'm I'm, I'm tithing for the first time I'm giving I'm being generous I'm helping people I'm serving I'm, I'm in the word God and Asaph says, at the end of the day, I think it might be pointless. Like maybe I should just be like the other people who don't care. Maybe I'll be blessed then. He says, all this stuff I've done for you, and it's really not worth it. You, you ever... You ever feel this way? You wonder where, whether it's really worth it to obey God? Like in the end, is it really worth it? You stay, listen to me young people, you stayed sexually pure. And you've got a boyfriend or you've got a girlfriend. And you know you're going to marry them. We all know we're going to marry them when we're 16, when we're 15, when we're 18, when we're 25. We're going to marry them, there's no doubt, right? And so, like, is it really worth it just to save yourself for marriage? That's real. Like, is, is it really worth it? Because I see, I mean, my, my friends, they live together. They did married things before they were married. They're doing great. So maybe, maybe it's not worth it. Maybe I don't need to wait. You've been o obedient in generosity. Maybe I, maybe I just don't have to give. Maybe I don't have to tithe. Maybe, maybe I don't have to be generous to people. It's not really worth it. Like, it's okay. Your marriage isn't what you thought it'd be. And you did everything prescribed. Is it really worth it to be obedient? To stay? You don't feel loved by your spouse anymore. So maybe, maybe you just should start over. God will forgive me anyway. Is it worth it? To be obedient. What if this stuff that you hear, you've read, and you've grown up in about God isn't real? These are questions that most people at some point ask. And if you're a parent of a teenager, they're asking it right now. I know it. This is Asaph, vanity. Have I just wasted my time, God? Because 
if this is, if this is how it's going to be, God, maybe I should just forget it. Just go have fun, live my life. Then he says this. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have been betrayed the generation of your children. And something happens when he writes this down or when he says this out loud. And let me tell you something, friends. Some of us need to learn how to pray. I'm not talking about praying in your head. I'm talking about praying out your mouth. And nobody has to be around. When you pray out loud, your heart speaks. The Holy Spirit moves. Some of us are so afraid to pray. I wonder if that's the reason God's not moving in your life, moving in your situations. Because when is the last time you vocalized how you felt? I'm not talking about gossiping to somebody else. I'm not talking about praying around people. I'm talking about you and God alone and you just cry out to God and tell him exactly how you feel. Don't hold back. He is God. He can handle it. If you're mad at him, let him know. If you're sad, let him know. If you are angry, let him know. If you are discouraged, let him know and say it. There is something about saying it. That changes things. I make my daughter say what she's done all the time when she's done wrong. And she doesn't want to. Why? Because when you say it, it becomes a little more real. This is Asaph. He writes it. If you don't write prayers, just, just try it one day. Don't commit to like every time you pray. Start with something you can do. Write a prayer to God. Vocalize it. And you know what Asaph realizes when he does this? Listen, this is the part you've got to grasp. Asaph says, I see all this. They're prospering. I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. I'm doing right things. I don't feel like you're there. I don't feel like I'm blessed. But when he says, I will speak thus, at that moment, it's like the Spirit of God whispered to him. Asaph, why do you serve me? Why do you obey me? Is it because of what you can get from me? Or is it because you want to be with me? Some of us are looking for God to make our lives better on earth. Right? Right? Fix my marriage, fix my finances, fix my children, fix my job, give me a house, give me the truck, give me the church. We want our life to be easy. And this is the reason that Asaph was so envious because he wanted life to be easy easy. See, I think churches have messed up. They give altar calls. They, they, they present this Jesus and it's a, like a, not all Jesus. It's mostly Jesus, but a little bit of false Jesus in there. And we say, Hey, just give your life to Christ and everything will be better. Ah, it won't, it won't on this earth. In fact, it will probably be harder in this life, there's going to be trials. It's going to feel like what Asaph felt like. Don't think all of your messes are going to turn to miracles. In a moment. That's false. Jesus didn't come to give you a better life. He came to give you a new life. A life that you can have more abundantly. But we're still looking for stuff. This is Asaph. And then... Just listen to what he says in verses 16 through 20. He says, when I thought how to understand how the wicked are prospering and just all of this, it seemed to me very wearisome. I was tired. It was discouraging until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. When I got into the presence of God, I realized what's going to happen to me. And what's going to happen to them? Now see, he says, truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment. Swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes. 
O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. In other words, when you step into the presence of God, when your mind is fixed on Christ, when you see things the way God sees things, when you're in the presence of God, your perspective will change. Eternity should change your perspective. Do you understand what I mean when I say that? We're too busy worrying about earthly things and, and, and not even having a second thought about our eternal life. Like we're saved, but we care more about the truck than we do the neighbor. Could it be that I'm longing for that truck, lusting after that truck because I got a neighbor who needs Jesus? We got to stop thinking about the earthly things so much and fix our eyes and our mind on Christ and the eternity that he has promised us. And now listen. When, when Asaph gets into the presence of God, when he gets, and, and, and I understand we're always in the presence of God, but he's talking about God's dwelling place. So let's think of it right here. When he's in the presence of God, his mind is not thinking about the problems of today. His mind is not thinking about the stuff he doesn't have or the bills he's got to pay or the job he's got to go to tomorrow or, the, or any of that. When he's in the presence of God, his perspective is now on eternity. On eternity. And he looks at his life and he says, have I been living a life that is a reflection of you? Have I been living my life pointing other people to Christ? Or have I been living my life pointing to, to my problems? Have I been posting what I feel about everything? Or am I pointing people to Jesus? Am I dealing with conflict the way Jesus would deal with conflict? In other words, the way Paul says it in Romans 8, he says he considers the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Do you, do you know how short this life is? My senior adults will be like, yes. <laughs> they're, they're holding on, they said. I heard it. <laughs> hey, man, life is short. Some of you have lost loved ones that you feel like died at way too early of an age. They, they didn't have hardly any life. We don't have control of our life. Life is a vapor. If you've lived 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, 104 years, like that is a blessing that has been given to you. And if you're not dead, God's not done. God, your, your best days can still be ahead of you. I'm, I don't want you just to think that you're older so you can't do anything for God. You, you, that's a mindset. Your perspective needs to be eternity. You have, you have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and aunts and uncles and cousins who need Jesus. What are you doing about it? What are you doing about a 70-year-old, 80-year-old? What are you doing about a 30-year-old? What are you doing about a teenager? Our mind has to shift from the now to the forever. Life is like a vapor, James says. And to the follower of Jesus, listen to me. I want this to comfort you. The most pain you feel on earth is the closest to hell that you'll ever feel. But hear me. If you are not a follower of Jesus, you have, you're playing a game. You're sitting here right now. You're fooling everybody except God. If you have not surrendered to Christ, the greatest moments on earth are as close to heaven as you'll get. And your life is a snap away for Mindy. Asaph realizes this. And he says in verse 21, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. He realizes, he realizes that moment, what some of us need to realize. 
Some of us are more interested in what God can do for you than who God is to you. He says, I was like an animal, a beast. Y'all, I got a dog named Nugget. Nugget is fierce. She's like an 11-pound mini Dotson, wiener dog. And she's a mini and like, do you know what Nugget does? She cries all the time. I'm not, I'm talking literal cry. Like it sounds like a baby is whimpering and she's beautiful and she's so cute. And so you want to help her all the time. She does it when she has to go out. She does it when she's hungry. She does it when she's cold and she expects a blanket to be put on her. I mean, and, and we got problems. We know we're the problem. We got it. Don't be judging me. Okay. But, I, but you know what animals do? Animals typically are only interested in what you can do for them. Their next meal. Scratch their belly. Play with them. Comfort them. Take them out. Asaph says, I was like an animal to God. I cried and expected him to answer. I've treated God like a genie in my lamp. Or my 911 God. My wish giver. In other words, listen, and I believe many Christians do this. We wouldn't say this, but our actions do. We use God. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like to be used. Don't use me to get what you want. But how many times do we call on God only when we need something? Only when we really just want something. This is Asaph. And he's broken. And listen to what he says in verse 23. He says, nevertheless, never, God, even in spite of how I've behaved, even in spite of my actions, even in spite of, of me just almost doubting and giving up, God. He says, I am continually with you. God, you hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward, you will receive me to glory. No matter, listen to me, no matter what you've done, no matter what you do, no matter how you think and what you say, God will not give up on you. God is with you. He is pursuing you. Even when you run like the prodigal son, God will be waiting there with open arms to receive you, always looking for you. This is our God. And this is reality. Some of you are wallowing in your sin. Some of you are wallowing in your past and you're not doing the things of your past, but you're still living in your past. It is time to be set free from that lifestyle and that mentality you have a God who is holding you and you need to hold on to him that's how great our God is and how much he loves you and he won't let you go and, and Asaph says whom have I in heaven but you and there's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. I know you guys are excited about heaven. But I think sometimes we're more excited about the people we'll see. Than we are the savior of the world. I can't wait to see mama and daddy. My stepdad and my granddad. And my grandma. Meet people in my family I didn't know. I can't wait. I wonder if animals will be there. I wonder. Uh, the, the, the streets of gold. Uh, it's going to be bright. Like what are we going to be doing all day? We get so focused on all that. Asaph reminds us. The best part of heaven. Is God. Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit. The Trinity. Asaph says, there is nothing on earth and nothing in heaven that is greater than our God. Can I just t remind you something, child of God? If you are a follower of Christ, you have God dwelling inside of you, the Holy Spirit, which means you have the best part of heaven inside of you. I just wonder if other people see the heaven or if they see you complaining, they see you griping and wishing you had and needing more stuff. Are you a representative? Are you an ambassador of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? 
Asaph says, I got to stop worrying about all this stuff. Start focusing on eternity, not mine, not mine. By the way, this is how you have joy when times are hard. Knowing that the best part of heaven is inside of you. That's how you get through. Losing someone. A bad diagnosis. Losing your job. Failing a class. Not getting accepted. You've got to come to the point where you know that Jesus is better than anything that, that life has to offer. And anything that death can take away. Asaph says, he finishes it out. He says, my flesh, my heart may fail. That's good news. We're not going to be perfect. He said, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Behold, those who dare far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. In other words, if not Jesus, then who? Listen to me. Some of you think that you can save yourself. Asaph says, if that's you, just try. And if it's not you, you think it's another God, you think it's having more money or having the American dream or, or living for yourself and just having the best life you can right now, see if that satisfies. See, we've got to focus more on eternity than our empire. And, and, and Asaph says, verse 28, for me, it's good to be near God. I've made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your work. So practically, what does this look like for us? Because see, how do we fix our minds on eternity while we're looking at earthly things, right? That's, what, well, that's why it's hard. You want the promotion, you work hard, you don't get it, and you're like, gosh, God, why? Because we're looking at all the stuff that we want. We want a bigger house. We want a better, you know. So we're working. So how in the world, I, Chris, I love Christ. I, I'm, a, I'm a follower of Jesus. But how do I do this? Three practical things. Number one, in this last verse. He says, it's good to be near God. Number one, be close to God. Be close to God. Well, God's with me. Yeah, 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 yeah. God's with you, but are you with him? See, he's holding on to you, but are you holding on to him? How do you do that? Number one, get in the word daily. I don't care if it's one verse or 45 verses, one chapter or one book. Get in the word. Well, I don't feel close to God. Keep reading. That, that's the problem. We, we read the verse of the day on the Version Bible app. Oh, hey, thank you, God. I praise God I was in your word. But then, then we live our life like we, it had no application on us. Keep reading. Keep reading until you know God is there, until you know God is speaking. Get in the word so the word gets into you. So that verse now can speak to the situations that you're going before. Get close to God. Get planted in the local church. Don't come sporadically. God is here. God is in this place. The preaching of his word is going. The praises of his people. The encouragement that you felt. The smiles. Sometimes the frowns. The prayers. I mean, God is in this place. Get planted. Get on a dream team. Serve. Pray. 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 Renew your mind, Romans says. Renew your mind. Some, you know what repentance is? It's not, just, it's not just turning from something. It's a changing of your mind about that something. So we got to get close to God. Then we have to trust that God is good. Even when your circumstances aren't. You trust him. I trust that my wife loves me, even if her actions say otherwise. She trusts that I love her. I love her, even if my actions say otherwise. Because I trust her. I would lay my life down for her. She would lay her life down for me. We trust his word, that it is good, that it will help, that it will convict. We remain pure because the pure will see God. And lastly, we tell others about Jesus. That's what Asaph says. I'm going to tell of your works. When is the last time you told somebody that didn't know Jesus about Jesus? When is the last time? Maybe never. Well, I don't know what to say. Just tell them what you know about Jesus. Don't. How much. How much must we hate people 
not to tell them the good news of the gospel. We're more concerned about messing up or looking bad or not having time than we are about our neighbors, our co-workers, our family. Can you doubt? Absolutely. But when you doubt where God is, what he's doing, how could he allow this to happen? That should drive you to your knees and drive you into God. So our team is going to come back up. We're going to sing lover of my soul. And I just want to ask you. Could you take 30 seconds? Let's do this. Close your eyes right now for 30 seconds. Where is it that you struggle believing God? Where is it that you lack faith? Or that you're frustrated with God about something. Right now, think about that. And just honestly confess that to him. Here's what I know. Jesus didn't promise you that life would be easy. But he did promise that your life could be eternal and eternally spent with him. But you have to lay it all down and trust Christ. Trust that Christ came and lived and died on a cross in your place because we are sinners. But that he rose again back from the dead supernaturally so that we could be with him. If you've never done that, I invite you today. Surrender to Christ. If you're struggling with this, pray. This altar's open. Would you stand? Father, bless us now. Speak. You're the lover of our soul. I know that there are people in this place, people online that are hearing this message that struggle with doubt. May they fix their eyes on the author and finisher of their faith. May they not be so focused on the earthly things, but the eternal glory that waits ahead. May you, may you spur, spur us. May you stir us to share who you are. I pray now that we think of someone right now who needs Jesus and that we are moved to action this week to share. I love you, Jesus, in Christ's name. Amen. This altar's open. You come. Father, we trust you. We trust you. We trust you, God. Where we're broken, you will make us whole, God. What we confess, you will cover, God. When we confess, there's healing that takes place, God. So as we leave here today, Father, we give you our life. May it be poured out as an offering today. And as you continue to pray, I just want to ask, I feel led to ask, how many of you would say, Chris, I... I've never given my life to Christ. I've never given in my heart. I've never laid it down. I've never completely surrendered control to Jesus Christ. But today, in the best way I know how, I want to give him my life. You believe he's the son of God, lived on this earth, died a death in your place, and rose again. And that when you call on the name of the Lord to save you, he will, the Bible says. If that's you today, just on the count of three, if you just slip your hand up and look at me, I'm not going to embarrass you I just want to pray for you if that's you you need to surrender today to Christ on the count of three just lift your hand one two three just say hey I need Jesus today I need I need Christ is there anybody like that online you can do that our host will be there for you online listen if, if you made a decision for Christ today you want to learn more about the church you want to get connected on your way out stop by the connect counter we got beautiful smiling people there ready to talk to you if you need a Bible if you, if you accepted Christ and wanted a new believer kit, we've got some tools and resources for you today. Hey, we want you to go out and be the church today, okay? Youth, tonight, we're going to start. We have a new time. It starts at 6. Doors open at 545. Youth, come. Bring your uh, friends. And uh, it's going to be great. Love you guys. Go out and be the church. You're sent. God bless.